So welcome everyone. Today we're talking about gene expression analysis. So this is foundational when it comes to biology, but it's also foundational when it comes to computer science because we're going to be talking about clustering and classification as two very uh, fundamental tools. So we've wrapped up genome one on, uh, sorry, module one on genome annotation. So we talked about alignment through dynamic programming. We talked about alignment through database search and rapid string matching. We also talked about heat markup models, uh, both uh, sort of, you know, in, in two different versions, both the one path and the all path across a lot of uh, increasing state and complexity. Now we're entering module two, which if you look at the progression of the class is about the dynamics of gene expression. So basically the first one is about understanding the quote unquote static genome. The second one is about understanding the dynamics of first transcripts themselves and then the epigenome, uh, sort of the modifications of the DNA. In module three, we're gonna talk about the gene regulatory circuitry, basically looking at regulatory motifs, network structure, and deep learning. In module four, we're gonna look at how uh, genetic variation perturbs these genes, these expression patterns, and these circuits, and talk a lot about disease genomics. And in module five, we're gonna be talking about evolution and comparative genomics and phylogenomics. And then we're gonna have the, the quiz and then switch to current resource directions. So what's in module two? In module two, the computational foundations are gonna be supervised and unsupervised learning, but also read mapping in super, super blazingly fast ways. And also two dimensional structure of uh, RNA. And then on the biological frontier, we're gonna be talking about gene expression analysis, transcript structure, epigenomics, and then the three-dimensional uh, genome. So for today, the goal is to talk about, uh, number one, the basics and the foundations of gene expression analysis. On the technology front, the two pillars, namely microarrays and RNA uh, sequencing. And then uh, on the computational front, the two pillars of supervised and unsupervised analysis. So uh, after introduction, we're gonna talk about k-means clustering, and hierarchical clustering, then a generative approach to classification, and then if time permits, a discriminative approach to classification. And then for the clustering, we're gonna have both the partitioning approach, where we select the number of clusters and then partition, or an agglomerative approach, where we don't need to select the number of clusters in advance. So, just one second. So, uh, in terms of technology, the two aspects of uh, gene expression profiling are basically from uh, number one, uh, microarray technology, and number two, next generation sequencing. So what does microarray technology do? It basically says, I have a set number of genes in the genome, and I'm gonna make probes for every one of those genes. I, I'm gonna have a number of probes, each with uh, you know, DNA segment, that will be homologous to the gene of interest that I'm interested in. And we basically reverse transcribe RNA into a two-stranded in in two molecule, cDNA, complementary DNA, through reverse transcription. And then we hybridize this DNA to these probes in this microarray. And through DNA-DNA hybridization, these strands are basically looking for each other. And then if you radio label, for example, uh, you know, these um, um, cDNAs, typically with a fluorescent dye so that you don't have any radioactivity. So if you fluorescently label your cDNAs, you can then look at the fluorescence intensity for every one of your DNA spots and then infer the expression for every one of those genes. And the way you do that, that you synthesize DNA probes through complementary hybridization. And then you could either make one long probe for every gene, which is less typical, or you can make many short probes for every gene. So tiling the gene with multiple short probes that gives you robustness. Or you could tile k-mers across the genome in order to sort of detect uh, in an unbiased way what are the features that you're interested in. Or if you're interested in a large genomic interval, you could like tile only that genomic interval and effectively ignore the rest of the genome. So the advantage of microarray technology is that it allows you to focus on specific small regions that you care about, even if they have very, very few molecules per cell. 
the revolution that has happened over the last 10 years in next generation sequencing has basically allowed us to now supersede this microarray technology that came at a time when sequencing was very expensive and therefore you wanted to synthesize your array once and then hybridize, which is very cheap after you've massively produced this array. The next generation technology has been really to resequence the DNA every single time. So you basically uh, have your mRNA molecules as before, you reverse transcribe them into cDNA molecules as before, and you now can uh, directly sequence these mature mRNAs and then map the reads using the techniques that we talked about earlier, but also some more recent techniques that we're gonna talk about in two lectures. You can use these to now map hundreds of thousands of reads from every experiment back onto the genome. And then using this mapping approach, you can then ask what is the number, the count of reads that was mapped to every gene that I know about in the genome, and then infer the count that way. So with mRNA sequencing technology or any kind of other short RNA sequencing technology, we're sequencing short reads from the mRNA, from the messenger RNA. We map those to the genome. And there's many variations. We can either count the genes, count the reads that are mapping to each known gene, or we could reconstruct the transcriptome de novo for every new experiment. And we're gonna talk about that uh, next time. So the advantage of this is that these are digital measurements and they are de novo. So basically you have an exact count rather than some level of intensity that you see through hybridization. Uh, and this count is basically the number of RNA molecules, which gives you some hint as to the abundance of that mRNA transcript through all kinds of normalizations based on how long is the read. You need to normalize for the total read length based on how many reads total did you sequence. You need to normalize by the millions of reads that you sequence. So the typical measure for that is RPKM or reads per kilobase of your gene per million. So R per kilobase per million, RPKM. So the advantage of this approach is that it focuses on small regions, even if there's a few molecules per cell. And therefore, if some uh, region has very, very low abundance molecules, you don't need to go and sequence the entire transcriptome until you get to the bottom of the barrel and you call those molecules. You can directly probe them. The advantage of this is that you don't need to know in advance what are the uh, specific genes that you care about. You can just carry out an un unbiased mRNA experiment, uh, an mRNA sequencing experiment, and then infer from that unbiased uh, sequencing what are the counts of all of the known genes and are there any other genes that were not mapped there that are perhaps abundantly expressed? Okay, so who's with me on the uh, biological foundations here and the technology for actually measuring gene expression patterns in the genome using either microarray technology or um, RNA sequencing technology? Okay, so um, 176210, this is pretty good. Um, Oh, did I do, uh, let's see, calls. Oh yeah, perfect. Um, okay, so now you've done your measurements. You've basically measured 20,000 genes in hundreds of conditions. So in the first condition, you have your 20,000 genes and you have all of their expression levels. In the next uh, microarray or the next RNA sequencing experiment, you basically have another vector of expressions and then another one, and another one, and another one. So you can basically now infer for every single gene its expression level across n different types of experiments. And you can basically build an expression profile for your gene, and you can compare along one dimension for the gene-to-gene -gene similarity, and basically ask, are these two genes behaving in similar ways in their expression profiles? So you can think about the expression pattern of a gene as a new type of vector orthogonal to the previous vector that you had. Um, but that allows you, of course, with the proper normalization for each experiment, that allows you to basically build a gene-gene similarity set of questions that you can ask by comparing the green vectors to each other. Alternatively, you can basically say, well, 
which experimental conditions are most similar. For example, if this one represents schizophrenia and this one represents, I don't know, uh, a medical intervention, then you could basically say, aha, that medical intervention perhaps mirrors schizophrenia or perhaps opposes the directionality of change in schizophrenia and perhaps would make a good drug for that. So you can ask questions along the uh, green uh, sort of comparisons or along the red comparisons. Okay. So who's with me so far on these two uh, dimensions for studying uh, gene expression measurements? So basically you can either ask using these 20,000 long vectors about the similarities between different experiments or these 100 long vectors uh, about the similarity between different genes. Okay, so 173600. Um, so uh, any, any questions so far? So basically what we're going to be talking about today is computational methods for exploiting these types of data. So for understanding uh, something about the biology through either clustering or through classification. So we basically have 20,000 genes, hundreds of conditions, and we can either cluster things together or classify. What does clustering mean? Clustering means grouping similar items that likely come from the same category and in doing so, revealing the hidden structure of our data. So we can basically cluster uh, genes together. We can cluster this dimension, or we can cluster conditions together, or we can bi-cluster. We can basically infer groups of genes and groups of conditions that have similar properties. So uh, for example, this set of genes might be enriched in chronic lymphocytic leukemia or B cell genes or proliferation functions or lymph node functions and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is not relying on any prior annotation. It simply says, let me look for, in an unsupervised way, let me look for patterns of similarity between genes. And then you can have some kind of independent validation of the groups that emerge by basically saying, well, these genes actually mean something because th this grouping means something because these genes are enriched in a particular function. So who's with me on the sort of goal of this unbiased uh, clustering? So the conditions, ERES, are basically when, uh, like, it could be the expression in liver or the expression in brain, or it could be the expression after a meal, or it could be the expression when I'm at the hospital, or when I'm feeling well, or when I'm feeling sick, or if you know I had a particular uh, metabolic condition, or if I was overweight, or if I was young, or if I was old. These are the conditions. All right, so 25, 4, 0, 0, 0. Uh, isn't that an annotation? So the annotation is more, you know, again, you can use different words for different things, but annotation is usually used at the gene level to basically annotate the function or the putative functions of different genes. And um, sure, uh, the conditions, basically the reason why I'm referring to them as conditions rather than annotations is that the word is less ambiguous. But you could think about the tissue or the experiment or the you know, um, disease or any other kind of condition. Whereas annotation could refer to the specific function of a particular gene. That's why I'd rather not use that word. All right, so that's on the unsupervised learning side. Now there's a supervised learning side where I actually have some known classes. I know that, you, you know, there's a bunch of genes involved in, you know, pancreatic beta cells or uh, germline B cells or T cells or activated B cells or proliferation or lymph node. So if I know that these genes play a particular uh, role in the cell, I could basically say, what are the features in the expression patterns of those genes that allows me to find these genes as a group or to discover additional genes that should be members of that group? that I wasn't able to discover before. So basically the goal of classification is to extract features from the data. These are basically the expression levels of particular conditions. That could be a feature, like what is liver expression? That's a type of feature. That best assign new elements to one or more well-defined classes. 
So supervised learning has a set of classes already predefined and then sees how are the genes mapping to those classes based on their expression patterns. Whereas uh, clustering is basically not relying on any previous annotation and only afterwards it will sort of come in and say, well, you know, what are the clusters corresponding to biologically? So here you use biological data in advance. Here you only use biological data as a validation after the fact. Okay. So let's see who's with me on the classification versus clustering and the difference between the two. Awesome. Okay. So uh, 167000. All righty, so now let's move to the formal part of the, uh, the course. Basically, on one hand, now we've defined the biology. Let's now move to the sort of theoretical domain to sort of work with these objects. So let's now talk more abstractly about clustering versus classification. Even though we introduce them in the context of gene expression, clustering and classification are pervasive in machine learning and computer science. These are ways to uh, characterize objects by one or more features. So if, if our objects in this particular case are uh, genes, for example, the features could be brain expression, liver expression, or expression across 40 different uh, tissues of the, of the human body, or the expression across 2 million cells of the human brain. Okay? So these are the features. So every point is a gene, and every uh, point lives in a super, super, super high dimensional space, with perha perhaps hundreds of different tissues that its uh, expression has been measured in, or millions of cells that the gene's expression have been measured in. So basically, the, the space is gonna be super, super, super high dimensional, but in this lecture, we're gonna be showing it in two dimensions just for simplicity visualization, of course. And the goal of classification might be to say, well, maybe, I already know that there are red and green genes or red conditions versus green conditions. And then the features could be the expression of different genes uh, in that tissue. So classification is basically looking where the, there's labels for our points and we want a rule, quote unquote, that accurately assigns the la uh, labels to new points. So if I have a gray point that gets added, I'll be able to say, okay, that gray point probably is a red point, and that, green, that gray point is probably a green point, depending on where, where it's found. So basically a sub-problem of classification is, of course, feature selection, understanding from that 100-dimensional vector what are the features that are the most important. And of course, your metric here is going to be super simple. It's going to be the accuracy of classification. And you can use sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and other types of measures that are based on the known categories. So what do you mean by high dimensional space? So Lily, I mean, uh, uh, the two dimensional version would be if I only measured expression in two conditions. If I measured expression in brain and I measured expression in liver and that's it, then it's a two dimensional space because every gene has two dimensions, one value for brain expression, one value for liver expression. But uh, if I measure expression across 40 uh, tissue types, or if I measure expression across 2 million cells, then the gene's vector uh, is a 2,000 dimensional or you know, 2 million dimensional uh, entry. And you're looking at similarity in this 2 million dimensional space if I'm measuring expression across 2 million different cells, for example. So that's classification. Uh, clustering is basically uh, unsupervised. There's no labels. You simply group the points into clusters based on how near, how proximal they are to one another. And the goal is to simply identify structure in the data. And your metric will be some kind of independent validation features as we saw here. So here we cluster without recurse, recourse to any of these uh, annotations in advance. But after you've clustered, you then go back and say, are these genes enriched in a particular category? Okay. So um, let's see, how's the pace so far? So um, 
Okay, so 15 people are just right, and then four right above and two right below. Um, okay, so what we're gonna see first is clustering, and then we're gonna see classification. So for clustering, we're gonna look at two different types of clustering. Uh, we're gonna look at k-means clustering, which divides objects into non-overlapping clusters, such that every data object is exactly one cluster. And agglomerative is instead like hierarchical clustering. It's a, a set of nested clusters organized as a hierarchy. So with partitioning, we first choose the number of groups that we want to partition in, and then we use an iterative approach for uh, assigning uh, individual genes to those groups. Whereas for agglomerative, I don't need to know the group, number of groups in advance. I can just hierarchically cluster and then decide where to put the threshold and then define the groups afterwards. And of course, with partitioning, you could build it on some K that you pull out of a hat, or you can try a bunch of Ks and then see which, which K leads to the most, uh, you know, the nicest result. Okay. And of course, you know, if you're doing multiple hypothesis testing, you'll have to correct by the number of ways that you cluster. All right, so we talked about gene expression analysis, the technologies, and then the difference between supervised and unsupervised clustering, and also the difference between microarray and RNAC. So now let's switch to uh, the first type of clustering, which is clustering by partitioning, and then we're going to look at clustering by agglomeration. So let's dive in. So we're going to look at k-means, and first we're going to look at the algorithmic formulation of k-means and then the machine learning formulation of k-means. So first we're gonna talk about the update rule, the optimality criterion, and then fuzzy k-means. And then we're gonna go back and revisit what would a generative model look like based on what we've built before for HMMs, and then uh, define a full expectation maximization approach for doing the k-means clustering. So what's the basic idea of k-means clustering? It basically says, let's assume that there's a fixed number of clusters a fixed number k of clusters, and that we're going to partition the points into those k clusters with the goal of making them compact. Okay, so it's very simple. We're given a k, and we're basically saying here's a bunch of points. Can you somehow partition these points into three groups? And the question is, how would you do it? So I have a bunch of points. How do I find what groups to partition them into? So I could basically start by looking at what is the pairwise distance between them, start computing some distance metrics, or alternatively, what I could say is let's make a guess. Let's basically sort of put a green cluster here and a red cluster here and a blue cluster here, and then assign points that are nearest to each of those clusters, and then update the clusters according to the points that were assigned to them, and so on and so forth. So that's exactly what k-means clustering does. It basically initializes k cluster centers randomly. And then it repeatedly assigns points to the nearest center and then moves the centers to the center of gravity of their points that are assigned to them. And then you stop at convergence when there's no more reassignments. Okay, so let's see uh, how it works in detail. So basically we randomly initialize the clusters and then uh, maybe I'm gonna choose a cluster there, a cluster here, and a cluster there. Notice this is probably not the best choice because green seems to be equidistant between those two clusters. So let's see what's gonna happen. After I've randomly initialized the clusters, then I assign every data point to a nearest cluster. So basically based on the distance between every point and every other cluster, I'm gonna basically say, let's label the points according to the cluster that they are closest to. And in this particular case, all of those points appear to be closest to the green cluster, and all of those to the purple cluster, and all of those to the blue cluster. Okay? So after I've assigned the point, and uh, by the way, are you guys still there? My connection seems to have been reset. Okay, but you guys can still hear me. That's great. Um, so uh, let's see, there's a chat. Is the first assignment done randomly? Yes. So Evelyn, the first assignment is done completely randomly. So, uh, and, and you could initialize a bunch of different ways. And then every single time you initialize, you basically sort of arrive at a different local maximum of the overall cluster assignment. And you could try, I don't know, 20 initializations. 
and then choose the one that ends up with the most compact clusters. So basically, here's we are, here we are in step number two, or, or sorry, no, step number one is randomly initialize the clusters. Step number two is assign the data points to the nearest cluster. And then, that's where the cool part comes, we recalculate the cluster centers. Now that I've, la that I've labeled all of these points green, I will then move the green centroid to the center of mass of the points that were assigned to it. And I'm going to move the green, the blue centroid to the center mass of the points assigned to the blue, and then the purple uh, centroid to the center mass of the points assigned to the purple. And then what's really cool is that I just need to reiterate. So then I assign data points to the nearest cluster and I keep iterating this. So that, and notice what's happening now. Even though initially the green circle was equidistant between those two, because the orange circle moved to the center of those points, that means that I now have competition. Prior to you know, the first iteration, these uh, green points were nearest to that cluster, but now that this guy has moved here, they're actually nearest to this cluster. So after this initial iteration, the points are erased from any labels again, and then they are reassigned to the nearest point, to the nearest center, and that's when these two points, which were previously far away from purple, are now right smack in the middle of purple. So I update the points to now be purple. And then I move the center of mass. And then I keep iterating. But the problem is that nothing else changes. And that's what we call convergence. So the algorithm has not converged. And we have an answer. And we have assigned our three points. OK? So uh, the question, is convergence always guaranteed? Uh, not necessarily. In some cases, you might sort of go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And we'll learn all kinds of machine learning tricks for stopping that. One of them is known as simulated annealing, which basically means that initially you take big steps, and then after that you take smaller steps, eventually sort of damping down the system so that you don't just keep jumping back and forth at infinitum. So, but yeah, most of the time, unless there's some degenerate cases, you will usually converge quite rapidly. All right, so now let's start defining the two steps uh, of k-means. So I'm going to start using some nomenclature that actually mirrors the expectation maximization technique that we saw earlier uh, in the context of HMMs. Um, but we're going to now review it because it's even uh, more direct in this particular example. So remember, we basically were uh, maximizing the parameters, we're basically inferring the maximum likelihood parameters of our um, uh, model. And then using the maximum param likelihood parameters, we're estimating the annotations of our sequence in the HMM case, or we're estimating the annotation of our data points in the case of ex expression patterns analysis. So basically, we're reassigning every point to the nearest center. And in doing so, we're basically minimizing the distance between the two centers. So in this expectation step, we are basically taking the you know, uh, expected assignment of these points to the cluster. Basically, it's kind of like a parse, a probabilistic parse of our data in the different classes. So how do we know the L2 norm makes sense for this data? This is not an L2 norm. This is, um, this is the Euclidean distance between your data points. So basically, what we're doing is we're asking, how far do I need to travel between uh, you know, each point xi and each centroid mu k? Okay? So between the kth cluster and the i point, the distance that I need to travel in Euclidean space is this. Okay, so this is, uh, let's see in chat, but how do we, uh, but this is how far, yeah, so we're going to come back into these norms, but um, this is not an error term, and this is not um, a weight uh, penalization, this is really just a Euclidean distance between uh, the points and the centers. 
Okay, so basically we are assigning the points to the nearest center and then using these assignments, we're updating the centers to the mean of the points that are assigned to it. Okay, so the mean at iteration n plus one is gonna be simply the average over all of the xi's with particular label uh, that, we're, that we care about um, and dividing by the total number of points. Okay, this is the cardinality of uh, the number of um, uh, genes, for example, that belong to that particular label. Okay, so, um, you know, these are pretty trivial. We're taking Euclidean distance and then we're taking, or at least the square of the Euclidean distance, and then we're also taking the simply geometric average uh, here. Um, all right, so what is this algorithm? This is basically a recipe. We haven't yet told you if it's any good. All we're saying is a recipe. It's like, you know, follow these steps, and then, you know, we don't know what the cake will look like. But we can actually talk about the optimality criterion for whatever that recipe creates. So we can think of k-means as trying to create clusters that minimize a cost criterion associated with the size of the cluster. So what it's basically trying to minimize is some kind of cost structure on all of the points, which is basically a sum over all centroids of how compact are the clusters that the centroids correspond to. So basically it's a sum of the distances between every point and the centroid that it's assigned to, summed over all um, centroids, over all clusters, okay? So basically, to minimize this distance, we need to minimize every cluster term separately. So basically, how do you minimize this? Uh, you know, you're minimizing that with the, you know, expanding the square. It's basically the sum over x squared minus 2ab uh, plus b squared. Um, and that's simply sum of all x squares. That's interesting this doesn't actually depend on the label so we can just get rid of that and then the uh you know minus the mean times a constant which doesn't depend on the k again plus some constant which again doesn't depend on the k with uh you know the the mean okay so basically these two terms are basically minimized whenever um, UK is basically, uh, you know, sort of meeting this criteria, which is basically minimized whenever this, you know, XK, 1 over XK is the same as that, which basically creates that to, to the, the whole thing being zero. And that's basically minimized by the centroid. So what K means is actually doing is effectively minimizing the clusters by choosing the centroids in the places where uh, you know the center of gravity of these points is, and that minimizes this total error term here. Okay. Well, there's this, there's a little bit of a problem here. So basically, the problem is that some of the points might actually be exactly halfway between two centers. So then the question is, why would I assign it a hundred percent to the purple center, where in fact it is equidistant, and maybe I should be assigning it 50-50. Maybe I should be giving some, you know, proportional weight rather than an absolute 100% weight to each of the clusters. And that's what fuzzy k-means does. What fuzzy k-means does is instead of having sharp boundaries, it has fuzzy boundaries. It basically reassigns each point not to one center, which is the closest, but to all centers, each weighted by the distance between the point and the center. So basically, every point gets assigned to possibly multiple centers. So this point here is, you know, maybe closest to purple, but pretty close to green as well, and a little further from blue. So it gets assigned probabilistically some weight for each of those, okay? So basically for every point, we calculate the probability of membership for each category. And that's the probability that this point has labeled K given the coordinates of the point and the coordinates of the cluster. 
And then we update the centers, not to the average of all of the points that are 100% assigned to them, because no point is going to be 100% assigned right now. Instead, to a weighted mean of the points, weighted by the probability of membership. So you're basically saying that the next centroid is going to be the sum over all xi's that have label j with some probability of the coordinates of that point times, i.e., weighted by the um, you know probability that the centroid is really the one that generated that point. So basically, instead of assigning every point 100% to one cluster, I'm now assigning it probabilistically to multiple clusters. So basically, regular k-means is basically a special case of quasi k-means where the probability of that label that we're using here is 100% for the closest and then zero otherwise. But you could actually make this simply a gradient distance and then that allows you to have both of them uh, sort of weighted accordingly. Okay, so let's see who's with me on quasi k-means. Oops, <laughs> I asked about the, shape, the, the pace instead. So um, let me go back to how well are you doing? Perfect, how, how well are you following so far? Awesome. So uh, 15, 12, 1, uh, 0, 0. Okay. Uh, you notice here there's a little b variable. This basically allows you to put more or less emphasis on that probability and therefore, you know, sort of bias the, you know, the assignment according to the scaling of that probability. All right. So that was the algorithmic formulation. We talked about the update rule. We talked about the optimality criterion of basically making the clusters compact. And we also talked about fuzzy game means where you're allowing points to be fuzzily uh, assigned to multiple clusters. So you're going to have some points that are nearly 100% to each cluster. And then at the boundaries between clusters, you're going to have points that are sort of assigned partially only. Now, let's go back using the tools that we learned about last week and uh, on Tuesday to basically look at the machine learning formulation and build a generative model that corresponds to this k-means exercise, okay? So let's now see k-means as a generative model. So in a generative model, as you recall, we have the forward probability of generating an event given an underlying set of probability distributions. And that's exactly what k-means actually does. So you can think of k-means as basically having two Gaussians and you know, basically these are seen from the top, but if you see them from the side, they're gonna look like this. They're gonna basically be some kind of Gaussian in this space. And then, um, you know, so basically one of them is gonna be this way, and then the other one's gonna be, you know, some other kind of shape in the same uh, space, okay? So you basically have in two dimensions, sorry, in one dimension, you have a Gaussian distribution seen from the side, in two dimensions, you have a Gaussian distribution seen on, in sort of 3D. But when you see it from the top, this is basically, you know, the, the lines of the Gaussian as they're going up. So we basically have a generative model that says there are two Gaussians that the data is sampled from. I have my red Gaussian and I have my blue Gaussian. So it's effectively a Gaussian mixture model. It's a model, which is a mixture of two Gaussian distributions. So if I have basically this generative process, I flip a coin first, and then I choose one of the distributions to sample from. So I'm gonna be like, okay, now I'm gonna sample from the blue distribution, which say it's 30% probability, or I'm gonna sample from the red distribution with 70% probability. And then I'm gonna generate the points from that distribution by basically sampling from the Gaussian. So 
I have you know way more chances of sort of sampling a point here than sampling a point there, each according to their probability. So I'm basically you know I don't know four times more likely to sample something from here than from there based on the relative areas of these uh, curves. Okay, so I'm now sampling points from that Gaussian mixture model, but the points don't come off as red or blue the points come off as gray. I don't know which cluster generated each of those. So basically, in a Gaussian mixture model, you're looking at the world and you're saying, well, you know, let's now assume that whatever I see was generated according to two Gaussians, but I don't know what point was generated by which Gaussian. That's the hidden variable. That's the latent variable. That's the nuisance parameter. I'm basically trying to sort of estimate this whole process without having to explicitly you know, uh, talk about which points were generated by what. What I'm going to be doing is integrating over that, or out, as you'll see soon, uh, sort of iterating over that. So basically, these are samples that are drawn from a normal distribution with unit variance, a Gaussian mixture model. So basically, the probability of emitting uh, point x from centroid j, point xi from centroid j, is simply uh, you know, given by that Gaussian distribution, which is one over two pi, and then the exponent, uh, the, the exponent function is basically e to e to the minus the distance between these two points divided by two squared. So that's basically describing exactly that Gaussian drop-off where the further you go from the mean of that cluster, the you know, faster this drops down in an exponential decay function. Okay, so let's see who's with me so far. Let's do a quick little poll. Lovely. Good. So um, 198020. Okay, so that's the Gaussian mixture model. That's how we sample the points uh, from it. And then the question that we're going to be asking is can we now use Bayesian inference in the same way that we you know, used before of changing the direction of that inference? So we basically now have the arrow that goes from the centroid to the point. Can we somehow use Bayes' rule to reverse this arrow and basically say, what is the probability of each centroid being the one that generated the data? if what I have is the observation, okay? So it's the same framework that we saw before, now seen in a slightly different text, uh, context. So given only the samples, how do we estimate the maximum likelihood model parameters of both the centroid definitions, namely where should I put mu1 and mu2, as well as the point assignments, which point should I call a red and which point should I call a blue? And that's basically uh, clustering via a generative model. So basically, I'm inferring a generative model. It's a parametric model that basically has two parameters for the first centroid, the x and the y coordinate for it, two parameters for the second centroid, unit variance for both, and then um, you know just some probability, prior probability for each of the centroids, which I'm going to assume now is uninformable. OK? Um, all right, so what, you know, so how do we solve this problem? Given only the samples, how do we estimate the maximum likelihood model parameters for both the centroid definitions and the point assignments? That's where expectation maximization comes in just like before. So we're gonna iteratively estimate the centers from the point memberships and the assignments, the memberships, from the centers, okay? So we're gonna iteratively carry out two steps, the E step and the M step. In the expectation step, we're basically saying, okay, we now know the centers, let's estimate the memberships. How easy is that? So if I know the centers, I can estimate the memberships by basically asking with what probability would I have generated the red from the M2 distribution, sorry, this point here from the M2 distribution and the same point from the M1 distribution and they both have some probability of generating that point. And that probability is directly dependent on this generative approach. So basically I have the probability of generating each point given the center, 
And now I'm going to estimate the membership by flipping around that probability and basically saying what is instead the probability of this center given the point that I've observed and the probability of that center given the point that I've observed. Okay, so let's see if we're working so far. So if I know the center, uh, then I can infer the assignments based on simply using Bayesian inference and Bayes rule on this generative model. Okay, so um, 157220. Um, so that's this direction. The reverse direction is if I have labels for my points, how do I estimate the maximum likelihood centers? So that's when I'm going to have to search over all model parameters and basically say what is the setting of these model parameters that maximizes the probability with which these you know, model would have generated the points that are assigned to it. Okay. So basically we're going to be choosing the centers and we're going to be choosing the labels that maximize the total probability of my data given my model. And it turns out that the solution to this challenge is exactly the k-means algorithm. And the reason for that is that when you work out the math, the maximum likelihood estimate, all of the uh, center uh, coordinates for either mu1 and mu2 is basically the algorithm, it, it's, it's the parameter mu, you know, which is this vector across x, y, z, and however other dimensions. It's the parameter of the centroid that maximizes this log product of the probabilities of generating each of the points given the parameters of that center. And that's nothing more than the argmax or the same mu of, since it's the log of a product, is the sum of the logs. And the sum of the logs is basically taking the log from exactly that equation. And that log is basically the log of this plus the log of the exponent, which is basically the exponent itself. And that's nothing more than uh, minus one half, oops, uh, so basically it's this constant, which I don't care about, because basically it doesn't depend on my parameter, you know, and then the exponent is nothing more than minus one half of this. And then how do I maximize that? By basically minimizing the negative of that number. And then that's nothing more than exactly the k-mean solution of basically finding the centroid of the xi's in order to minimize that solution. So that's exactly the, the k-mean solution. So what's really cool is that we basically first saw from basic principles and a geometric interpretation that we could simply assign points to clusters in order to make the clusters compact. And right now, we're basically seeing the machine learning formulation, which is how do I maximize the total log probability of emitting this point from the centroid? And it turns out that the solutions for the two are exactly the same because the exponent of that Gaussian function is nothing more than this delta that I was using before of the Euclidean distance squared between the two points. Okay, so uh, who's with me so far? Let's see. <coughs> awesome. So uh, thirteen six zero three zero, and then the last thing is, uh, who feels that they've learned something cool today? So um, is this like? Ah, this kind of makes sense. Awesome. So nine nine seven two zero. Okay. Um, are there any interesting results using this approach, but with non-Euclidean instances and other types of distributions? Absolutely. So Erez, we're going to talk about other types of distributions very shortly when we talk about agglomerative clustering and, and, and uh, hierarchical clustering. Um, all of these other methods that we're going to talk about also apply here. All righty. So that's for the M step. It's kind of cool that the EM solution is actually the same as the uh, K-mean solution. What about the E step, basically, where we are now estimating the most likely parts 
of our data. So basically the goal is now we're gonna be assigning the points, we're gonna be assigning the labels that maximize the probability of the data given the model, that's the total probability. And that's basically maximizing over uh, you know, all Ks the, uh, you know, the label, the cluster with which this is maximized. So basically taking the maximum over all possible cluster assignments K for the point XI uh, with, based on its coordinates. And the argmax of that is again the argmin of the exponent. And that solution is once more the nearest center. Okay, so once more, the EM solution is equivalent to the KME solution when the uh, assignments are now seeking to be made. Okay, so I hope that you're starting to see a pattern here where basically we saw these K means formulation with the algorithmic approach and the probabilistic approach. With the algorithmic approach, we initialize the clusters and the centers, and then we assigned every label, every point, the label of the nearest center according to this, and then we move the centroid of the points with that label and we iterate. In the probabilistic in interpretation, we again initialize model parameters, and one of these model parameters is basically a bunch of centroids, and then we estimated the most likely missing label given the previous parameters, and that's basically this maximum likelihood estimate was exactly the same distance, and then we chose the new maximum likelihood parameters given the points. For the fuzzy k-means version, we calculated not which is the nearest center, but the probability of membership for every point of each class. And then we moved the center to the weighted centroid rather than just the centroid, weighted by that probability. Whereas for the fuzzy k-means, uh, fuzzy k-means probabilistic interpretation, here we're estimating not the most likely missing label, not the one path or one parse, but instead a probability over all possible missing label assignments. This is equivalent to the all paths algorithm. So basically instead of giving a single label, you're giving, you know, probabilistically all possible labels given for each parameters. And then you choose the new parameters to maximize the, not just the maximum likelihood, but the expected likelihood weighted over your label probability estimate. Okay. And then this probability of the data given the model is guaranteed to increase at every iteration of the expectation maximization algorithm. Okay, so basically as we're doing uh, fuzzy k-means, with k-means is not necessarily the case because it could basically you know, keep jumping back and forth, but with fuzzy k-means, you're guaranteed to increase this uh, likelihood. Okay, you're, you'll always arrive at a local maximum. All right, so uh, now let's step back a little bit more and basically look at the power that you have using this full expectation maximization model. The idea is the following. With k-means, we were constrained to only have uniform priors. There was no such thing as class priors where I could basically say there likely are more green points than blue points, for example, or something like that. So you can't have a prior. Whereas with the EM generalization, you can actually include that in your uh, formulation. Each time you can basically take the argmax using priors rather than just using these likelihoods. So uh, the k-mean solution was also assuming that there's a unit distance function which is symmetric across different dimensions across x and y. Whereas the expectation maximization generalization assumes this Gaussian distribution and uh, allows you to have a covariance matrix that allows you to vary jointly across multiple dimensions. Okay, so for the label assignments, the k-mean solution was simply picking the maximum and the fuzzy k-means was using the full density but in the sort of probabilistic and machine learning generalization, we now can use either the full density just like fuzzy k-means with expectation maximization, or we could even sample from that posterior distribution using Gibbs sampling, which we're going to talk about more in the motif discovery lecture. So again, if you look at the parallels between heteromorphic models and expression clustering, so basically 
Uh, remember when I was talking earlier about these nuisance parameters or these hidden labels that we're kind of integrating over or estimating and then building on? So here we're basically uh, calculating this total probability, integrating over all of the cluster labels. But with HMM learning, what we have basically done is iterate over all, uh, you know, sort of hidden labels, which were that state path. And we had two ways of doing uh, HMM learning. One would be Turby training, where we were labeling the sequence with the best path. And here, k-means is assigning each point to the nearest cluster. So I hope you can start seeing the parallels between the different lectures. With Bangwell's training, we were labeling the sequence with all of the paths. That was posterior decoding, where you were basically using the full forward uh, probability, the full backward probability, summing them up, and then I gave you all of the paths going through this so that you don't have to just choose one focal assignment. That's what fuzzy k-means does. It basically assigns every point to all of the clusters weighted by the proximity, which is again a one-to-one -one map with a probabilistic interpretation of the probability that that cluster generated the point that you care about. And then what we're not gonna see today, but what, what you should already be thinking of uh, is that instead of labeling a sequence with all of the paths, we could simply sample a single label for each position, or we could assign to a random cluster by sampling by proximity. So instead of basically saying that every point goes, you know, uh, equitably in all three clusters, we could basically say, well, if it's 60% probability of being in this cluster, 30% probability of being in this cluster, and 10% probability of being in that cluster, I'm gonna sample according to these probabilities, and then whatever the sample tells me, I will assign 100% to that one, okay? So basically, with 30% probability, it will go 100% here. With 60% probability, it will go 100% here. And with 10% probability, 10% probability it will go 100% here. This is very cool, right? It basically says that I will allow my system to sort of be, you know, fully committed with 10% probability. And that's fine. It won't make that mistake, quote unquote, often. But if it does make that mistake, quote unquote, it will go fully committed to that mistake. And then maybe the next time around, it will get out of this mistake. Or maybe it will allow you to explore a solution that would otherwise not be accessible. Okay? So who's with me here on the difference between uh, k-means, viterbi, and greedy, which is basically choosing only one annotation, fuzzy k-means, bomb welch, and you know, expectation maximization, which is using all of the solutions, each weighted by its probability, and then give sampling, which is only choosing one by sampling from that motif, from that distribution. Okay? So uh, let's see. Who is with me so far? Check, 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 and find the right poll. Awesome. All right, so we have 138410. This is great. Um, okay, so. This is, you know, k-means clustering, okay? So basically, this is clustering by partitioning, and we saw both the algorithmic formulation with the update rule, the optimality criterion of making the clusters compact, and the fuzzy k-means version, as well as the machine learning formulation with the generative model and then the full expectation maximization solution. Let's now switch gears completely and talk about hierarchical clustering. So this is a model-free clustering, that is basically treating every point as a cluster without sort of having a lot of fancy parameters about the distribution according to which the uh, points were generated. So we're gonna look at the basic algorithm and then we're gonna look at different distance measures and then sort of how to evaluate the clustering results. So one of the challenges of k-means is how to pick the number of clusters k. So how do you select k? If my goal is to make the clusters compact, <laughs> That's super trivial. If I have 100,000 points, I just choose 100,000 clusters. Every cluster has zero standard deviation. It's centered exactly on that point, and it perfectly captures the training data. 
of course, it also has zero generalization power because as soon as I have a point that's not exactly on one of my previous points, all of the other points have basically, all of the other clusters that correspond to points each have basically zero probability of generating that additional point. So that's obviously not very nice, okay? So, um, you know, this, the question is obviously, what is a meaningful improvement? Can I increase the number of clusters and make the clusters more compact? Yes, but at what, co at what cost? And how do I penalize the increased model complexity? So we're gonna talk a little bit about Bayesian information criterion in less, later lectures about sort of how to penalize model complexity. But hierarchical clustering is one approach that completely sidesteps this issue. It doesn't actually care to define a predefined number of points, enough clusters. So instead, it basically says, let's start with each point in a separate cluster. And at every step, choose the pair of closest clusters and then merge them. So here, I would first choose D with E. They seem like to be very close together. And then whatever new cluster I get by merging D and E with F is probably the next cluster and then A and D. And then all of these guys together are pretty close. And then the next one is C and then GH and then the whole thing. So that basically gives me a hierarchical set of nested cluster memberships that basically uh, you know, tells me how every point is related to every other point. And that's basically uh, hierarchical clustering, also known as unweighted pair group method with arithmetic mean or UPGMA. And we're going to revisit that in our phylogeny. So unweighted pair group method with arithmetic mean. And then if I want four clusters, I just cut with four clusters. If I want five, five clusters, I just cut a little lower. If I want three clusters, I just cut a little higher, okay? So we can select the cut level to basically create disjoint clusters from them. Okay, so let's see who's with me here on the hierarchical clustering algorithm. Oh, very cool. So 91% um, at 100% and then 9% in the 60 to 80 category. Um, okay, so um, you had previously asked about the distance metric. So how do we choose the distance metric between two clusters? You could basically say, well, two clusters are as close as their two closest points, or maybe they're as far as their two furthest points. Or maybe they're as close as the average of all pairwise comparisons of points between these clusters. Or maybe they are as close as dictated by their centers of mass of all of the points assigned to those clusters. And each of those methods has different implications. So if you use single link method, which is basically the minimum of any pairwise distance, you basically end up with clusters that can zigzag around and sort of connect long points through chains of proximally connected points. If you choose complete link, which is basically forcing the maximum distance between any two points to be minimized, that is um, forcing the clusters to be as round as possible, as sort of compact and round as possible. Using average link is, you know, somewhere in between the two. It basically sort of averages both and has good properties for both. And then the centroid method is, um, you know, somehow ignoring that there's really no probability mass here in the middle and could be, you know, somewhat misleading. But again, for different applications, different methods uh, apply best. And the other thing to realize is that the cluster distance metric will affect not only the results, but also the runtime. So basically here, I only have to compute you know, one distance based on that average, whereas here I have to compute every pairwise distance. But conversely, if I've computed every pairwise distance once in n squared cost, after the fact, I don't need to recompute any distances or any centroid, whereas with the centroid method, I basically have to recompute the center every time I do a merge and recompute the distance between that merge and all of the other clusters, which is actually also expensive. 
So that was the cluster to cluster distance. We can also look at the point to point distance and basically look at what are the gene expression similarity measures that can uh, capture the individual point to point distance. So if I have the expression of one gene and the expression of another gene, I could basically use the Euclidean distance or I could use the Manhattan distance or I could use the Pearson correlation or the uh, Spellman rank correlation or the absolute of the uh, or, or squared correlation between these uh, points. So basically there's a lot of diversity in the way that I can actually compute these uh, distances and then um, you know they will also affect the results. So basically and the point to point distance will of course also affect the cluster to cluster distance so this is something that you can experiment with. If you know the absolute expression levels, then you probably want to use either of these two distance metrics. If you know that the absolute expression level doesn't matter, but it's just a relative one, then you're probably better off using either Pearson correlation or Spellman rank. If you have a lot of outliers, then the rank correlation can be more robust and so on and so forth. So you can you know, be aware of all these methods and sort of the settings in which each of them applies best. So that's basically the basic algorithm and the distance measures for hierarchical clustering. And once you have the results, you'd like to evaluate just how random is it? How unlikely is it to get these types of results? So how do you evaluate that? Well, you can basically ask about, I don't know, cluster compactness or um, you know, some kind of distribution measures. Or you could basically use an independent validation metric that says, oh, well, I have some annotations for these points. So using these annotations, I can basically choose to uh, look for enrichment of a particular class of annotations in each cluster. So you can basically um, evaluate your cluster performance in many ways. You could, you could say, is it robust? If I choose random samples from the data and then recluster, are the clusters showing up repeatedly? Or are some clusters only found in one kind of iteration of sampling? Or, as I mentioned just now, we could look for an enrichment of categories of genes that are overrepresented in particular clusters. And that's something that's very commonly used in motif discovery, which I'm gonna talk about in a couple of lectures. So how do we evaluate cluster enrichment? So the, the question is the following. I just created this blue cluster based on the distances of the points. And four of the points in the blue cluster happen to be green. And then uh, outside the cluster, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven happen to be green. Is this a random partition? So I can basically ask how much of an enrichment would I have expected if I had chosen this cluster randomly? And that is simply given by counting using this hypergeometric distribution. You're basically saying, what is the probability with which I would have chosen k elements at random and ended up having m of them or more be, um, you know, above some expectation uh, to be in the green category. So that's given simply by all of the ways that I could choose K elements out of N uh, here. So basically all of the ways that I could choose the K uh, elements in the blue circle out of the N total elements. And then out of all of those ways, how many ways would I expect to have at least M of my points out of the green category, and at least k minus m, basically the remaining ones, out of the yellow category. Okay, and that sum over all of the numbers m that are greater than r is basically that hypergeometric distribution, and that allows you to evaluate the probability of a single cluster that contains k elements, of which at least r elements are uh, positive. Okay. So you could basically use that to now evaluate cluster uh, enrichments in particular functional categories. So we did unbiased clustering, perhaps agglomeratively using this, and now we're setting a threshold and cutting 
these clusters at some point, and they were asking how non-random is the enrichment in each of these different functional categories. Okay. So that was clustering by agglomeration and clustering by partitioning. That's when we don't know the categories in advance. But for classification, we kind of already have some categories. So let's now see how we can use a generative approach to classification. So we're going to use a discriminant function and then define it based on class priors and class condition distributions, and then look at the difference between take training and testing and how to combine multiple features and also how classification works in practice. So again, there are two approaches to classification. There's a generative approach or a discriminative approach. For the generative approach, Bayesian classification is very common. And um, you know, among them, naive Bayes is the most common. And the reason for that is that we might have no idea how to evaluate the prior probability. And that's what naive Bayes does. It basically says, actually not, not the prior probability, but, but the uh, dependent between multiple dimensions. We might say, well, all of my metrics are perhaps independent. So what naive Bayes does is that it assumes independent across multiple dimensions of our data. And one way to make sure that naive Bayes applies might be to first take a dimensionality reduction approach where you're looking at the principal components of variation of your data set, and then these principal components will be more or less independent from each other, so then you can use naive Bayes on those principal components. So uh, Bayesian classification allows you to do that, and it poses the classification problem in probabilistic terms. It models the feature distribution in terms of the specific class that every element belongs in, and it uses probabilis probability calculus for making the decision. Whereas the discriminative approach, such as support vector machines, has no modeling of the underlying distribution, and it makes decisions using simply the distance from the boundary. And that's similar to the HMM versus conditional random fields that we saw at the end of the last lecture. So what does a generative model do? It basically says, I have a bunch of samples and they're drawn from some distributions. And these features, now I'm gonna look at a one-dimensional view, which is actually even simpler than the two-dimensional view, but you can expect that there are you know, hundreds or thousands or even millions of dimensions. So basically, these are the features for every class, and they're drawn from a conditional probability distribution. This is conditional of a class, or class conditional. So we're basically going to assume that the data along each of the dimensions, of which there can be hundreds, is distributed according to some Gaussian distribution of obtaining these values of x given class 1. And maybe class 2 has a higher average, but a similar standard deviation. And that's the class conditional distribution of class two. So in general, what we're going to be asking is, what is the posterior probability of this data point coming from class red, given the feature that I've just observed? And we're going to obtain that in a Bayesian inference way, given the generative model, which basically says, what is the probability of the feature given the class? So that's probability of each feature on the, each dimension, given class one and given class two, okay? So I have the probability. So if I'm trying to classify this point, I'm, I can basically say, well, how likely is it that this point was generated by the green distribution, it's that height over here, versus the red distribution, it's that height over here. So I'm probably gonna choose this to be labeled as green if I were trying to classify, okay? So let's see who's with me so far on these Bayesian classification using these Gaussian distributions. Awesome. So 149110. So notice that this is actually just a special case of our fuzzy K means probabilistic interpretation. This is basically when the class is already given, and therefore I can actually explicitly calculate the class conditional probability distribution. So I, you know, I can basically calculate the probability of each feature given the class. So for example, DNA repair genes might show higher expression during stress. So you can show this versus that. Or protein coding genes might show higher conservation levels, again. Or regulatory regions might show higher GC content. And in general, you're going to have some kind of foreground 
signal or to some kind of background. And if you know both distributions, you can classify a new example by simply choosing a cutoff to minimize the classification error or to maximize the posterior probability. So classification is trivial. It's just choosing a threshold in each of the dimensions. It's basically saying along this dimension, I'm gonna choose the cutoff probably exactly where these two points cross if I have uninformative priors for classifying something as red versus green. But if the prior for class one is higher, then I'm gonna scale the green distribution up and then the threshold is probably gonna move slightly to the right at the point where the scaled distributions are now crossing. And if I have many classified examples, I can estimate the model parameters using either a parametric or a non-parametric approach to estimate the class conditional distributions. So a parametric approach will basically say, well, it's Gaussian distributed. It has a mean and a standard deviation. A non-parametric approach might say, well, let me just bin it into seven bins, and I'm just gonna estimate the probability for each of the bins. And again, we're gonna be using Bayes' rule of asking, what is the probability of a class given the feature, given that I have a generative model that basically tells me the feature given the class. And we're gonna be doing this using Bayes' rule of estimating the class given the feature based on the feature given the class, scaled by the prior of each class, and of course the whole thing normalized by the evidence, which doesn't actually matter because it's the same with both classes, and therefore it can be divided out. So you can actually express this as a discriminance function. So what is a discriminance function? It basically says, above which threshold do I choose one class versus the other class. And that discriminant function is simply whenever the probability of class one given the data is greater than probability of class two given the data. And that is nothing more using Bayes' rule than the probability of generating X from class one times the prior of class one and the probability of generating X from class two given the prior for class two divided by this normalization marginal, but you can sort of marginalize it out. And that gives you the probability of class one, you know, times the prior of class one, probability of X given class two times the prior of class two. And that is, you know, whenever that's greater than that, it's simply whenever this is greater than one, and whenever the log probabilities of that is greater than zero. And that's what we call a discriminant function. So I can select class one whenever that discriminant function is greater than zero, and select class two otherwise. Okay, so who's with me so far? Very, very nice. Okay, so uh, 10, 10, five, two, one. So three people are sort of, you know, not so there with me, but the other 25 are pretty good. All right, so now that was defining my discriminant function and then training and testing is super simple. It's basically given that I have a bunch of points that are green, I'm going to estimate the probability of that feature given the class one. And then uh, one way to do that non-parametrically is to chop it up and then just simply measure the number in each class, of course, with the zeros causing trouble as always. And the problem with those zeros is that as you go to higher and higher dimensions, there are more and more zeros because in one dimension, I can split my dimension to five bins, but in two dimensions, I need to split it into 25 bins, and in three dimensions, into 125 bins, and in four dimensions, into 625 bins, and if I have a gene expression level in, I don't know, uh, 100 conditions or two million cells, then these zeros are basically everywhere, so big data becomes little data in the curse of dimensionality, basically, which makes the data sparser, so that's why probably, uh, so um, parametric models are usually more powerful for these types of approaches. And then for getting the priors, it's super easy. You just count the number of red points and the number of green points in your training data, and that gives you your priors, okay? And then as for combining multiple features, again, um, naive base basically tells you that along each of the dimensions, I'm gonna make the simplifying assumption that the classes, are the class conditional distributions are independent of uh, each other, that the, the dimensions are independent of each other. 
So basically, you're assuming that the features are independent given the class, not just fully independent, but class conditionally independent. That probability of x1 given the class uh, times probability of x2 given the class is the same as that joint probability. So it's just a product of each of the class conditional one dimensional distributions. And the beauty of that is that it's super, super easy to compute and it's you know, pretty, close, a pretty close approximation most of the time, especially if you sort of first check that your features are mostly independent. Okay? And then this just becomes the sum over uh, a bunch of log scores because you can just uh, do that. And of course, you, you can have your binary classification error, your sensitivity, your specificity defined as a function of your true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives. Okay, so then again, in practice, you basically gather a lot of data, you sort of estimate these class conditional distributions, you can bin your data, and then, you know, sort of combine the multiple features together, and then in the end, you basically see that this very simple approach of naive Bayes has basically outperformed every single previous approach in this particular example of classifying microcontrol proteins. All right, so let's see if there's any questions. Well, if we have more than two classes, then it's exactly the same math. You can just, you know, sort of decide for each of the class conditional distributions for each of the class. All right, so let's see who's with me so far and um, uh, on the whole sort of lecture today. So gene expression analysis, k-means clustering, hierarchical clustering, and then naive Bayes classification. Awesome. Uh, so 7, 12, 4, 3, 1. And then the last part is who feels that they've learned something today. Awesome. Okay, so 913500. So uh, the support vector machines is optional material. We might end up covering it in a station, but um, you guys are not going to be responsible for it. Okay, so uh, everybody's excited about the mentoring session on uh, Friday. So you can see already there's uh, a bunch of ideas uh, input there. So what we're going to do during the mentoring session to tomorrow is that live, I'm just going to go through all of them from top to bottom. So you have extra motivation to enter your ideas early uh, and then just give you feedback on each of those ideas. And the beauty of doing it all together is that you get to sort of hear a little bit about the other ideas as well. And you also get to hear about your classmates and uh, you know, we'll have just an interactive session. And then hopefully that will help you form teams for the following week where we actually have the pre-proposals and then the peer review and then the final proposals. Okay, everybody with me so far? Awesome, good. All right, thank you guys. And then we'll see you tomorrow at the mentoring session. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.